Okay, so now we have a claim and we have the evidence in support of the reasons. The claim is intellectual property rights are key to a transformation that's occurred in the world in the last 200 years and that um, the, U the further claim I'm going to make is that the U.S. was one of the leaders in this and a key to U.S. economic leadership has been intellectual property rights. And we've presented the evidence in support or the reasons in support of the evidence, which is it allows a market to function. And we now need to ask, okay, what set of facts are relevant? So we have to ask, well, what would be like the ideal experiment? So there's a lot of experiments we cannot run as an experimental math matter. We have to approximate them using observational data. So my favorite example of this is parachutes. We have never run a, a randomized controlled trial of the hypothesis that parachutes work and prevent people from dying when they hit the ground. So there's actually a journal article about this. It's a tongue-in-cheek article. Um, we don't know that as a matter of a randomized controlled trial. Um, it's just yeah, the reasons are pretty strong for why you want to wear a parachute. The other great example of this is uh, cigarette smoking. There has never been a randomized controlled trial of the impact of cigarette smoking on human health because it would be completely unethical to assign one group of people to smoke and another group of people not to smoke and then to wait 30 years and see who got cancer. That would be a really evil experiment, truly, truly evil. So we don't run it. Rather, what we do is we use observational data to approximate an experiment. And the question always is, well, how close can we get with observational data? Because as this uh, gentleman pointed out, there's all these potential confounders. And you'd want to control for everything. So we'd have to have a way of measuring the strength of intellectual property rights. We'd have to have a way of measuring how much innovations occurred. We'd have to know the right period of time. So as a first approximation, Here's a graph that is a very, very, very crude test of the hypothesis that intellectual property rights, the strength of enforceable intellectual property rights, contributes to economic development. This is a, um, the strength of intellectual property rights is measured here as the Donarte Park, who are two, uh, uh, two researchers, Donarte and Park, who measured the strength of the laws regarding patent rights around the world multiplied by an index put together by the World Bank on the enforceability of laws. The, there's a footnote about this in the paper that I referred you guys to, uh, Patents in the Wealth of Nations, and you can get the data. In fact, if you email me, I'll send you the data. Um, on the left-hand side is per capita GDP. Um, for those who are not quantitatively inclined, uh, if it's the case that intellectual property, the strength of enforceable patent rights, is, is, is causes growth, then you should expect, um, as you move this way on the x-axis, that GDP on the y-axis should increase, and that's what you see. Um, and I've put in yellow, excuse me, orange here, all the countries that are a standard deviation above the mean in per capita GDP, so you, they, they jump up, with the U.S. popping out there. Okay. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't just accept this. So if I were to just show this graph, you should not be persuaded for a couple of reasons. One is, how do we know that countries don't invest in intellectual property rights once they become rich? Causality could be going the other way. Or maybe intellectual property rights and GDP are jointly caused by something else. We don't know. So how are we going to address that problem? And, and I, here again, i got to say, I'm always amazed by the way people will throw up correlations of things, claim that this shows A caused B, and then when you say, well, geez, maybe it went the other way, they say, you're evil. <laughs> I confess to all my wickedness. Let us, let us just agree on that. I'm very, very wicked. Um, so, but that doesn't mean anything I'm going to say is wrong, right? So here's an attempt, very crude, I'm trying to do this graphically, to sort of see, well, geez, could there be something that might be correlated with both GDP and strong intellectual property rights? 
So here we have, again, this is the log strength of enforceable patent rights in 2010. On the left-hand side is financial development. This is uh, percentage of GDP. This is bank lending and stock, um, uh, the value of uh, market capitalization of stock markets and the market capitalization of bond markets uh, as a percentage of GDP in 2010. And then in order to capture the three dimensions here, very rich countries are in green, uh, upper middle income countries in blue, lower middle countries in orange, and low income countries in red. And you'll see that um, financial development and GDP are correlated. Yes? As one goes up, the other goes up. Uh, and that being wealthy appears to be correlated with both of these factors. So it could, in fact, be the case that really what's driving this is financial development or a host of other things that are all moving together, or it could also be the case that there's a package of good policies that give us economic growth. That's possible. And amongst those policies is strong intellectual property, or strong intellectual property rights. So we need a better test. So one of the things that this gentleman suggested was we should be exploiting the dimension of time. Take two countries, they're just like each other, Give one the patent pill, don't give the other the patent pill, sit there and wait. We can't do that, but we can look back in history to exploit the dimension of time. And one of the places we can do this is the United States. The United States is highly unusual in that the Constitution only contains a reference to one property right in it. Patents and copyrights, Article 1, Section 8. It's the only time a property rights gets mentioned in the Constitution. Or it's the only time that a property right is specified of a particular type. What was that about? Well, almost as soon as Congress is called into session in 1790, one of the first things they do is pass a patent act. And what they do, they're quite conscious of the fact that they've got to um, leapfrog ahead of England or at least catch up with England. Remember, in 1790, you think the United States is indebted today. In 1790, best estimates are, the debt from the Revolutionary War is four times GDP. So the US is heavily indebted, very agrarian, and by the standards of Europe, economically underdeveloped. So they're very conscious of having to catch up, and so they do this experiment. They say, let's take the British patent system, which is full of all these needs for bribes and fees and the like. Let's get rid of all the bribes. Let's knock the fees down to 1 20th of what the British charge. Um, and let's see what happens. Let's encourage common people to patent. And so the result is that is the Patent Act of 1790. And here is the, the outcome. People patent. So this on the bottom is our, our years. The colors give you the different types of patenting. Uh, and the y-axis got wiped out. Uh, those should be in uh, thousands. Um, oh, excuse me, no, those are not those. Those are per one million persons, so that's the right number. And the bottom line is this. Everyday people start to take out lots and lots of patents. There's endless patenting about everything. Uh, incidentally, many of the inventors are women, and many are people at the frontier without, formal, without much formal education. Amongst them is Abraham Lincoln, who patents, uh, this is in the uh, 18, uh, uh, 1840s, patents a, uh, uh, a method for lifting a, uh, a boat over the sandbars on the Ohio River. It never gets commercialized, um, but this is, gives you a sense of how widespread patenting is. Um, and here's one of the outcomes. So this is GDP per capita as closely as we can measure it. Um, and measured with a high degree of um, noise, the farther back you go. Um, so the United States is in um, uh, green, uh, the UK in uh, reddish orange, Germany in blue, Brazil in, uh, in purple. Now if you look here in 1700, the US has a per capita GDP that's pretty close to Brazil uh, and considerably poorer than Germany or the UK. And as you look over time, if you watch the green bar, you'll see that by 1870, the US has caught up with Germany and the UK. 
By 1890, it's passed them. By 1910, it's got a GDP about twice their size. By 1930, almost three times their size. And by 1940, about three times their size. And so if there's a fourth thing I'd like you to remember here is why did the US win World War II? It had a bigger GDP. It just simply outproduced everybody else. Now, the claim is that what's driving this, in part, is the patent system. It unleashes the, it allows a market to operate such that individuals are incentivized to come up with better ways of doing things, producing new products that no one had ever imagined before. So here we are in Silicon Valley. In 1870, what was going on in Silicon Valley? Not a whole lot. It couldn't have. Stanford didn't exist yet. This was a horse farm. That's a joke about Stanford, OK. Um, so if you're at Stanford for long enough, you convince it's the center of the universe. So um, yeah, she's nodding her head. Yeah, yeah. You must be a Stanford student. No, no. Berkeley. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I rest my case. You get convinced Stanford's the center of the universe. Um, so the. Where's, the, where's all this stuff in 1870 being produced? Cleveland. The richest city in the United States in 1870 is Cleveland. And why? It's the center of the electrical machinery industry. That's the Silicon Valley of the late 19th century. This is a key technology of the 19th century. Uh, we're, in fact, living in an environment that's the product of the electrical machinery revolution. All right, let's say you don't believe any of this evidence. You just think, all right, there's a bunch of graphs, and who knows. So let me try another take at this. So economists these days really like um, to use these night lights to show the distribution of economic activity around the globe. Some of you are nodding your head, yeah, you've seen this. Um, so here is the night lights. Uh, it's a composite picture done from NASA photos. This is 2014. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we could see this going back in time so then we could see how the distribution of economic activity across the globe had changed. So I put in a proposal to the um, director of Hoover, and I said, well, here's what I want to do. I want to find the Martians that have been circling the US, circling the globe, for the last 500 years, and ask them for their photos. And can I have a bunch of money to go do that? So after he called security, I uh, decided that maybe a better uh, idea was to uh, find another way to do this. And it occurred to me that really what all those light dots are picking up are cities and towns. So if we want to go back in time, we just have to know where the cities and towns were. So I did that. Now, I did that means that a group of research assistants <laughs> and a co-author a uh, grad student, Polly Sine, a friend of your, one of your TAs, uh, his name is Jordan Harillo, uh, and a computer programmer, uh, and I spent two years uh, identifying and geocoding every town and city on the planet between the, with more than 20,000 people from the present. Incidentally, there are 28,060 towns and cities with more than 28,000, with more than 20,000 people today, in case anybody asks you, it as a fun fact at the kind of cocktail parties people like me like to hang out at, which is to say we don't have a lot of fun. Um, going, going back then, every 50 years, back to 1500. So here's what the globe looks like in 1500. I've blown up the cities, because otherwise you wouldn't see them. If they were actual size, you'd say the world's completely dark, and you would be right. Now you're going to notice something, that the United States, if you have really good eyesight, has only one city in 1500 with more than 20,000 20, people. That's Nina Waya. It's uh, part of the Mississippian culture in the Mississippi Valley. Uh, you're also going to notice that Europe is um, a bit lit up, but that Great Britain only has two cities in it with more than 20,000 people, Manchester and London. Um, Scandinavia is pretty much dark. And if you were going to bet on an area of the world looking at this, who would you bet on? You'd bet on India, and you might bet on, on China. OK, here's 1800. So here's the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, look at the jump 
1500 to 1800. India and China get more lights, but not at the rate of Western Europe, Scandinavia, and Central Europe, or Japan. Look at Japan. Now look at the United States. You go 1500, 1800. Now something's starting to happen. Those dots, by the way, are Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Charleston. Let's now jump to 1900. Whoa. So what's interesting is if you go between 1800 and 1900, China doesn't change very much. Japan really pops. Central Europe, Western Europe, Scandinavia pop. The United States really pops. And not much is happening in China. Huh. So it suggests that something here, the United States and Western Europe, has changed that didn't happen in Asia. One of the things that happens, and so this is a project of long durée, this is the property rights system of the United States and Western Europe. In fact, what happens is Britain invents the concept of tradable property rights, comes out of British jurisprudence in the 18th century in patents. The US adopts it as a legal matter or as a constitutional matter in the Constitution, it then gets made part of the, one of the first acts, the Patent Act of 1790. And then there's an exhibit, exhibit in, eight, in 1851 called the Crystal Palace Exhibition, where countries display all of their technological wonders. This takes place in Britain. And the British cannot believe what the Americans have done. They're agog. And so the next year, they write a patent act that essentially is a copy of the US 1836 Patent Act. The Germans will look at this and they're like, oh, whoa. They copy the US Patent Act in the 1870s. Almost as soon as Germany becomes a unified nation state, one of the first things they do is institute the US patent system. The Japanese, in the Meiji Restoration, look around the world and they say, how did the US grow rich? And they say, oh, literally, the person who's put in charge of this says, oh, the US has patents. We're going to have patents too. They copy the US Patent Act. And in fact, around, not every country does this, importantly. China is a place that does not. There's a whole bunch of other policies they don't embrace either, which we can talk about in Q&A, about why they don't. But the important point is this. Across Western Europe and Central Europe, the US patent system gets adopted. And the places where it does get adopted, you get very fast economic growth. <laughs>